Okay, so you're saying yes. No, I mean, it's definitely getting to the point where the disturbance um, is really heightened. And of course, the question is, can we be generative with that disturbance or disruptive? And that's, we're really in that um, in-between space. Uh-huh. So it, it's pretty, it's, you know, people, all they can talk about is the referendum. And they're not just talking, they're starting to fight, which is always scary for me because we've already gone through a civil war and we don't want anything like that. But you've got very fundamental views, you know, with the no and the yes. Um, And then you've got people that are very confused and don't really understand what to do. And then there are others that are saying, well, I'm just going to abstain, I'm not going to vote. But it's a, a, you know, I think what a lot of people's dilemma is, um, Charles, is that they can't see the end of the tunnel. Do, do you know what I mean? Even with yeah. the yes or no vote, it's yeah. tough going ahead well, of us. Yeah, right? I mean, it's a step into the unknown. Absolutely. You know? and, and like a yes vote would be a step at least into the known. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like more of the same, like more of this, you know, descending spiral of misery. But exactly. at least you know, like, what kind of misery you're in for. Right. But no vote. Vote. The other thing, Charles, is that the argument is not about do we agree with the terms or not? Um, what you've got is you've got a whole section of the population, which is the yes vote, which is basically saying, yes, we want to be European and in Europe and in the Euro. So yep. that it's, it's, been, it's been politicized and it's being taken by um, the other three main parties, which is PASOK, Nea Democratia, and um, Potami. And they are really kind of the ones that are saying we don't want this left this leftist uh you know government um there are a bunch of jokers and we want to stay being in europe and we want to be you know equal players in europe so it's almost like there are two referendums going on for me (laughs) they're and they're different you know maria can can you just actually introduce yourself because um in case there's anyone listening to this at all at some point (laughs) So I'm Maria Skrudialis, and I live in Greece. I am Greek, and um, my work is in in participatory leadership, um, public engagement, and how do we actually come together and co-create new solutions, Um, Mm -hmm. especially from the challenges and the future that we don't yet know how to meet. Um, How do we do that generatively across the many and often conflicting challenges? diversity that we have um in our societies um yeah so mm. that's <laughs> you know i uh, this is reminding me of the scottish referendum in a way um right. I mean, there's some really key similarities uh that the uh british government was um stirring up a tremendous amount of fear like yeah. all of the arguments against independence were based on fear especially fear of the unknown and these kind of um hyperbolic threats about what could happen, you know, if they voted for independence. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the referendum lost, the independence vote lost. Um, But, and and I was actually in Scotland right in the aftermath of that. And I spoke to some audiences and I said, um, I said that the no vote, the vote against independence was a symptom that this society is still susceptible to fear. Mm -hmm. And that the work to be done isn't really so much the superficial work of persuading people that independence is a good idea, so we'll win next time. Because what kind of Scotland do you want to have? Right. Whether you're independent or not, you know, Scotland that is um, acting from fear isn't going to be a good country to live in. So the right. work is at a deeper level to, yeah. to, you know, undo the sources of fear, to spread love, to spread community, mutual support. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like, I know, like, there's a lot of that going on, like, like you know, grassroots stuff. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's been going on for the past five years since this crisis and as the escalation of the crisis. It's actually very much a part of our root system, Charles, in our culture. Um, the work of solidarity, of coexistence, of interdependence, and actually self-organizing um, or self-authority, which is part of the reason why we, we, we're not really great at a very large scale. We're great at a small scale, but not at a, great, at a large uh-huh. scale because we like to self-organize. 
and we don't like somebody else coming and telling us that there are rules that you have to follow. Our, our first instinct is to basically say, bugger off, we're going to do it our way, um, which can seem, sound very anarchic, but it's actually a very, very deeply held self-organizing kind of root system, mm-hmm. partly because that's how we've um, survived. Um, you know, the the many different traumas in in the history. So what has happened since 2010 is that um, the solidarity movement has seen amazing kind of neighborhood groups emerging um, that are helping people from those people that got their electricity cut off. um, How do you get the electricity put back on um, to helping with food and other, you know, needs that, that people have. You also have had an enormous movement in things like community um, doctors or clinics. Mm-hmm. There's an, a huge amount of people that are, they don't have any health care coverage. Um, so we've had an enormous um, kind of community health centers, which are completely run voluntarily. Um, community drug stores, you know, if you, if you've had relatives that passed away, but you the, the drugs they were taking are still within the sell by date, you take them and they are reissued to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, so you've had a lot of these kinds of groups emerging. You've had an enormous amount, not enormous amount, but we've got something like 40 plus complementary currency schemes happening across the country. Mm-hmm. Um, where people basically say we're unemployed, we don't know what to do, but you know what? We've got skills. We can keep exchanging. Mm-hmm. And why the hell are we so worried about money? So people are starting. I personally believe that a really new economy, a new solidarity economy, has been happening. And um, it's been three years now that we've been running a solidarity economy um, kind of festival every October in Greece. And yeah. it's to see what's going on around around the country there's a lot of like share and like okay i've got kids clothes that they don't need them anymore let let me take them to a share shop other people come along and and pick them up Mm -hmm. um so there's been a lot of those things there's also been what i call um protection groups that have emerged around Mm -hmm. resources or areas that is one of the big issues in this whole thing that is kind of below the radar and it's not is the issues of commons yeah Um, greece is one of the few countries in the world especially the western world but especially europe that we have had quite a large commons in other words you know our ports the sea a lot of the natural resources were held in the public Um, they were not held by private owners um, and there is a lot of speculation as to whether a lot of what's going on with the crisis is actually the bringing the country into a debt situation where you then have to sell off all of that stuff to get yourself out of debt. Well, that's how it's always worked. You know, yeah, exactly. that's, that's exactly. the strategy. You, you, right. And that's the, like the, the new colonialization that came after imperialism. And that's what we've been doing in Africa. That's what we've been doing, you know, so it's, it's really, it's very alive here. Um, so you've had these other part of the solidarity that's emerged are protection groups. So, for example, the old American bases, um, which is in a part of Athens, just outside of Athens, which is called El Nikos, was left after the Americans left in the late 80s. Um, and then they were talk about selling that land off for millions of euros, etc. So you had a group of people that went in, squatted it. We really have a movement of squatting as a way of preserving and conserving either landmark buildings or areas. Um, then you've had the whole big fight of Skouries, which I don't know if you've heard of. It's with the gold mines up in North Greece. In I haven't Thailand. heard about that, no. Enormous. It's a Canadian company that has bought up um, gold mines, basically. And uh, one of the offshoots of gold mines um, is cyanide, I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. which then poisons all the water. Um, in, in the area, and the local residents were fighting such a fight and against the previous government. Um, horrific. I mean, absolutely. Literally, you know, they, they were being gassed, the villages, the kids. Um, so that's been going on for a while. It's calmed down now. The new government 
has stopped that violent um, police, you know, kind of intervention that was with the previous governments. Um, let, me, let me break in here because I have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're talking about the solidarity movements um, and, um, you know, ways that people are taking care of each other that don't depend on having enough euros to purchase yeah. health care, for example, or getting together to protect the commons. Um, like, uh, on the one hand, all of these things, they're going to be useful no matter which way the referendum goes, because right. either way, there's going to be some economic hardship. Right. But, but also, like, this is the kind of thing that, that um, insulates uh, a people against fear, because... Mm -hmm. When you look around, when your daily life, when you see people taking care of you, when you see yourself taking care of others, you see people taking care of each other, um, you know that you're going to be okay. Like that kind of existential fear about mm -hmm. what's going to happen, you know, if I lose my bank account, you know. I mean, there's still fear there, but... Oh, it's huge. That's what they've done to us this week. Yeah, but it softens the fear a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that these actions, whether it's this referendum or whatever happens in the future, this kind of um, ground level solidarity building is indispensable. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's more important than right. the referendum. And it will per perhaps, if the referendum does vote um, no, yes. it'll be because of, you know, it'll yeah. be because of, of, of this um, kind of invisible or, you know, under the surface work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, it's very interesting what you're saying about the fear. Um, our present government, our prime minister, speaks very clearly about this. You know, mm -hmm. he's been, there's, there's been an interesting, there's a lot of, uh, what's the word, uh, opposites around this guy, right? There's a whole group of people that say he's a bozo, he doesn't know what he's doing, um, he's actually conniving, they've always come in to get us out of the Euro um, and out of the European Commission, um, and that that's been the tactic of their negotiation, which is where they're taking us now, inviting us to put a no vote. Mm -hmm. um, then there's another part of the, the community, and, you know, I'm part of that part, that listens to the guy speak. And, you know, you know when people are speaking from a place that's authentic. Yeah. There's a place of spin, or this is what you should say. Mm -hmm. And I just hear the authenticity in what's been spoken. Um, so, so what you hear from him is they asked, he was interviewed on national and uh, TV and, he, and the guy, the, the interviewer said, what is your worst nightmare? And he said, fear, people hearing fear. Hmm. That is my worst nightmare because it will not allow us to move. It will not allow us to become what we can become. It'll hold us back. And that's my nightmare. My nightmare is we will be fearful and mm -hmm. we will stay fearful. And he yeah. is basically saying, don't be afraid. You know, like the banks are doing this on purpose to us, but your money is insured. It's in there. Don't, you know, and of course he has to say that without knowing if it truly is. But the, the reality is, is this fear and this is what it is for me, Charles, when I, when I sink below or go above, whichever way you want to see it. For me, what we're in is one of the fundamental human questions we should be in. For me, humanity is going towards its suicide. If it continues on the road that we're on with the way that we support and finance a banking system, and a financial system that is living way beyond the limits of the earth, right? Yeah. So we are in a country like Greece where the debt situation, whether it's been set up or not, has brought us to what I believe the real work is. We need to sink into our roots and ask ourselves some fundamental questions about our assumptions about life. Yeah. So we this really is need to ask that of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel quite inspired that, you know, you have a political leader who is speaking authentically um, and giving an example of not being in fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, to me, this kind of ties together 
the political and the spiritual realm of discourse. Mm -hmm. Um, Because our whole system is entirely based on fear. Like the banks are acting from fear. The bondholders are acting from fear. What will I be okay if I, if I don't continue to strip mine all of the cultural and natural wealth from this planet and guard enough of it for me to protect myself, will I be okay? You know, it's the same question. Like, can I afford to be of service to the world? Can I afford to, to um, do what I love? You know, will it be okay? Uh, and I think that, it, that when this transition happens in one place, when people choose not to be in fear in one place, it kind of uh, provides an example and creates a field that um, enables it to happen in other places. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and as you said, the answer to the fear or the response to the fear is the solidarity. It is the sharing. It is the coming in community um, with one another because we then we then access a whole different level to our humanity and a whole, whole different level of capital resource whatever language you want to use capacity that that we can actually work from the the drug though is that a nation like Greece that went through a civil war after World War II that faced immense, I mean, we talked starvation and poverty um, into the 50s, mm-hmm. um, is, and then into the 60s, and then, okay, we had a dictatorship, so there was all of that, and then we came out of the dictatorship, we became part of the European Union, um, and the flooding of the grant process, you know, of the funding stream from Europe, for me, did more damage than good. Mm-hmm. Um, Because what happens is you had a society that was in fear of not having enough from having gone through the hardship. Mm -hmm. And the grant system and the flooding of all this money in some weird, not weird way, I know how it did it. It it, um, it reinforced the individualism of if I can have it, do you understand? And I'm okay, family's okay. And we're a very individualistic society. It's, it's, it's frightening, actually. We have, very, we have a lot of ethnic identity. That's where our commons is in, mm-hmm. in our identity. But in terms of you know, who we are, how I get on, it's me and my family. You know? And maybe my local community that I'm part of. Um, but it's very tribal. Um, and so there's... Um, there's something about that I've seen in these five years. I, I didn't grow up in Greece, but in the, in the, I've been living in Greece now nine years. And in the five years that I've seen the crisis and what we've been going through is that I have seen our society access some of the beauty hmm. of that solidarity and that sharing. And we have a word in Greek, philotimo, which is actually a friend of duty. But what it really means is I cannot see myself unless I see, I can only see myself in your eyes. Mm-hmm. So if I harm you, I harm myself. That's if the same. I, you, I love myself. That's the concept. I mean, it's, the, it's, you know, in Southern Africa, they call that Ubuntu. Right. Um, right. It understands that, that your well being and my well being are not fundamentally separate, which exactly. is opposite from the teachings of economics, right. which, you know, puts us all in competition with each other. And if I outcompete you and defeat you, um, then I'm better off. Right. And as long as I can, you know, have sufficient police forces and stuff to, to uh, manage your discontent. And we see the same thing playing out in Europe, actually, um, where, you know, the northern countries um, seem to think that, that you know, um, that they can somehow insulate themselves from the poverty and, and suffering of the southern countries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but, you know, if, like one, one appealing thing about unite a united Europe is this feeling of we're all in it together. We're not, you know, we're not really separate from each other and, yeah. and, and let's take care of each other as a continent. Right. You know? And I, I often think like I, I, I've been, you know, I, I spoke in Germany, um, not too long ago. Um, 
and I said, you know, like, what would this continent be like if everybody was like you guys, you know, very serious, very productive, you know, like, what about, like, don't you need places where you can go and like hang out all afternoon at a cafe? And there's like that culture that encourages that. Um, and just like, um, I guess it's kind of a spirit of, of appreciating the diverse gifts that all members of society and all members, you know, of the global society offer. Uh, and some of those gifts translate easily into measurable goods and services and others do not. Right. You know, it's just like, like in, um, you know, any small economy, you know, you have some people producing the stuff and then there's other people who are taking care of those people on a physical level who are, there's maybe some guy who doesn't produce very much, but he's the life of the party, you know, and he, and he adds fun to life and ease. And then somebody else tells good stories and, and like, all of those people hold the productive person in a place where he can be a joyful producer. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, um, it gets down to deeper issues, philosophical yeah. issues, even of what's real, you know, yeah. is it any of the things that we can measure? Yes. But, but what's happening here? Uh, I, I'm like, I don't know if, you know, I might put this recording out there at some point, but I, th I think probably most people understand really what's happening on an economic level in Greece, you know, how the debt works. But I want to maybe just touch on that and then you can respond to it because maybe not everybody is really familiar with mm -hmm. these dynamics. Um, right. But basically, so you lend huge amounts of money to a country like Greece and the money goes toward um, – well, some of, it, some of it goes toward corruption and things like that, but a lot of it goes toward building infrastructure, um, physical infrastructure and kind of cultural, political infrastructure that is geared toward enabling that country to export wealth. Mm -hmm. Because only by exporting wealth are you going to be able to make payments on these loans that have come in. If you, if you build, you know, nature preserves – that are free and open to the public, that's not going to generate revenue. You're not going to be able to pay back the loan. So you have to build highways. You have to build ports. You have to build factories. You have to build, you know, electricity grids. You know, you have to build um, market mechanisms that dismantle solidarity so that people no longer take care of each other but have to purchase services provided from the outside. All of those things grow the economy. You know, like insurance, for example. If you have a village where people – you know, rebuild their neighbor's house when it burns down, then there's no insurance market. But right. when you dismantle that, then, ah, here's a market for financial products. So yeah. that's, so like these, these, these loans are, are contingent on quote reforms right. that allow the country's labor force um, and natural resources to be converted into products that can be sold internationally to generate the foreign exchange that can be used to pay back the loans. Right. So, when the number, when, when the volume, when the magnitude of the loans is so large that they can never be paid back, mm -hmm. then what you have in the current situation is any new loans, I don't know how many people realize this, not a, not a single penny of it goes yeah. to actual Greek people. It goes directly to the banks, to the creditors. Right. And for the privilege of staying in debt, you get to cut your pensions, cut your salaries, Sell off the natural resources, sell your ports, you know, right. for the privilege of staying in debt. Right. And how long can that last? Right. You can never pay back the debt, so it has to last forever until right. there's nothing left, until you even export your young people. Right. Which we and, have done. Which, which yeah. is happening. Yeah. So that's the, the big picture. Right. Want to add anything to that cheery scenario? Yeah. Sure. I mean, for me... Oh, there's lots. Um, what, one of the f first things, what you just said, is whether I'm right or not, I just have felt intuitively at a very, very deep level of knowing in me that the financial markets, and especially the banking system, really did crash in 2008. <laughs> and to save it, huge amounts of national money went into it from different so-called rich nations that were able to do that. 
But that money was public money and private money, individuals' money that had to be re re coffered. You know, the money had to go back in somehow. Because how could some of these rich nations say to their electorate, oh, by the way, we took your money. We took your pensions. Mm -hmm. We took all the safety that you knew in your social systems, because we're so known for that, right? And we put it into saving the banking system. So because that truth could not be spoken, the capitalistic system that uses debt as an instrument to generate more wealth in particular parts of the world, uh, not in the, in the country of, of debt, um, was put into place. And like I wrote in, my, in, in the Facebook thing, um, Greece was really right for a country to be picked like that. Um, we have a history of leadership that in order to stay in the international community, um, you are very happy to give up lots of things, you know? Um, and it was in debt. They knew it was in debt. We never should have entered the Euro for God's sakes. You know, we knew we never were at the level of a country, but they needed the quorum in order to create the, the European currency. And so it was a perfect place to put this in, in, in motion. And certainly for myself growing up, I didn't live here, but I used to come here. We did have industry in Greece. We had electrical good industry. We had fashion, you know, clothes industry, mm -hmm. uh, shoe industry. We had products that were produced. Since being in the European Commission, that whole section has been systematically cut down mm -hmm. to the point where this country hardly produces anything. It is just a market. It became a market for, for German goods, for Dutch goods, for French goods, etc. But it's just become a market, right? So the ludicrousness of continuing to create debt and the debt has been massive because I don't know the actual figures, but it's something like we're 140 or 160 billion more in debt than the original debt. And that's just interest. And yeah. it's just spiraling and it will spiral forever and ever. And the ludicrousness of the European, the Euro group and the institution saying, can you please repay us by cutting pensions a little bit more or in, you know, um, increasing VAT is so stupid to me that I can't understand how intelligent human beings can even come they, up with these. They, they themselves, they do, themselves don't believe it. There was recently no. an internal document leaked that you know, I, I think it was uh, the, an ECB document, um, you know, basically forecasting that no matter what Greece does, that it will never exit the debt crisis. So, right. they, but but they're just like that's not something that they that they can. Um, that they're willing to face publicly. Um, they want to keep the game going a little while longer because they're afraid too. Well, now, I, they, yeah, yeah, just to there is, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Th there is an, a rationale behind all of this that they themselves maybe half believe. And it's, it's essentially the same rationale that went into the um, bailouts and stuff following 2008's financial crisis. It essentially, it says, okay, we're going to give lots of money to the banks. Uh, we're going to bail them out because what's going to happen is then they're going to use that money to um, lend. They're going to lend that money into the economy and that's going to um, stimulate economic growth and everybody will, um, all, all, all boats will rise in this rising tide and we'll grow our way out of the debt crisis. Mm -hmm. And that would be true. You know, so say, you know, Greece or Portugal or Spain or Ireland or somebody is laboring under a huge debt burden and you can't pay it now. Well, will you be able to pay it in five years? If your economy grows faster and the debt is growing, in other words, if your GDP growth rate is higher than the interest rate on the debt, then it will be easier to pay it in five years than it will be now. Mm -hmm. So all of these kind of rosy scenarios um, under which uh, the debts can be repaid and more generally under which our whole financial system can continue, all of these assume an unrealistically high rate of growth. 
Um, now, in the case of Greece, even assuming an unrealistically high rate of growth, they still can't pay it back. No. You know, the pretense with Ireland or Portugal, you know, it's like, you know, if we grow 4% a year, um, now, and that leads to a deeper problem, which is that not everybody can grow 4% a year. In fact, the planet as a whole is nearing the end of growth, especially of high economic growth. So if the interest rate is higher than the growth rate, then the wealth of the, the wealth holders, which is growing at the interest rate, if that growth doesn't come from overall economic growth, it can only come through taking things away from the debtors. <clears throat> right. So everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody um, is at least unconsciously hoping and assuming that um, growth will come back and this will allow us to continue on. Right. Um, and, and the people that are really voting for the yes um, on Sunday are people that are very vested and invested in the current financial system. Mm -hmm. um, and they really have an identity. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because there's, they're definitely the wealthier people in the, in the country, but also there's an identity that says without Europe, without being in the community of Europe, we're nobodies. You see, because there's an also there's a psychological element. You know, we're mm -hmm. this small country. We're not really known for anything apart for democracy from ancient times, you know, and and beautiful ruins and and the sea and the sun. You know, and it's like it's there's this real fear in a section of our of our society that without being in Europe, we are just going to wither and die, you know? And we're going to go back to being like our grandparents who picked olives and lived a very, very physical, hard life. Um, and, and there's just like nothing in between that goes on. Of course, that's just a section of the, of the society, of course. But the other, the other piece is that, um, you know, with this debt situation, it's, it's so ridiculous because what I would want to be seeing if I'm really part of a, a union and a community and believe you me I've worked I work with the community uh, the commission the European Commission mm -hmm. as an external consultant I love some of the people that work there they're they're people that really believe in the European values of these institutions and you know what was developed after World War two which was to develop a community so that we would never have that horror again yeah. Now, of course, in the history, it's, it's become something else, you know? We are not living those values. And I think that part of the problem of the past five months has been that we voted in a government because we, we just couldn't take any more, right? We voted in a government who went in to have a negotiation, but they took in the negotiation at a completely different level to where the other guys are coming in, you know? So the other guys are coming in and saying, okay, tell us, your terms. And our guys are saying, can we talk about the Europe we want? They're like, they're not even speaking the same mm -hmm. language. Then bring in the process of how Eurogroup meetings happen, which a lot of people don't know, but I do. You've got these member states with their little microphones. You've got the chair, your, your good Dutch guy that I can never pronounce the man's name, um, who kind of conducts it. There's an agenda. People have something like five minutes each to talk. Now tell me if that's space for dialogue. Tell yeah. me that space to sit in the unknown of really looking into each other's eyes and saying, you know what, guys, we don't know how to get out of this. You don't know and I don't know. Now what do we do? Do you understand? So if we're yeah. not willing to change the questions that we come around together and we're not willing to change how we sit together, you just get same old, same old. Right. And, and in that, in that um, environment, even if uh, one of the delegates, say the Greek delegate, says something from the heart, something authentic, it gets heard or translated into, oh, just another negotiating point. Trying, they try to decode it. What is the you know, subtext here? What is the message? Well, what if there isn't a subtext? What if it's just like the guy is actually saying what he means? Like exactly. listening for that. And then add in the political difference, because you're talking about left, of a far left, that Europe 
the, the left that we've known is socialist. These guys are considered much left than that. And then throw in the fact that, oh, these guys are young politicians, so they don't know diplomacy, right? They just kind of speak it as it is. They don't play the diplomatic role, right? Because they don't, partly they don't know how to do the diplomatic role. But of course, for, for the old timers, it's, they don't know what they're talking about. They're, there's tactics behind this. What's the subtext, you know? And, oh, and by the way, they've definitely come in to ruin Europe, you know, and the Euro. Mm -hmm. And then it spirals. And, like, I don't understand why there's no mediation in this. Why is there no mediation? Why has nobody thought to bring in a mediator? Bring somebody from, not from Europe, to support this conversation. They've yeah. not even thought about this, right? It's a, it's a good illustration of how... Um, Regardless of the players, yeah. the, the roles that are, that are defined by the institutions, you know, even by the room that they meet in, like the shape of the room, you know, the, the protocols that they go by, like you, you take out some people and you put in others and it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. the outcome is, is already defined by the structure. Right. And, and it, you know, it speaks to the saying that um, to change one thing, you must change everything. Mm -hmm. or, um, yeah. if well, you change one thing everything must change with it exactly yeah. and that's the systemic perspective Charles which again is really not held at all because to me part of what's also going on is a world view difference there is something about the government that we elected in whether they are conscious of it or not and I don't know that because I don't personally know them they are definitely coming from a different world view they are calling in a different world order. I don't, like I said, I don't know how conscious they are that they're doing that. I think they are pretty conscious, but they are really the way they speak, the way you can just feel it. So to me, there's a war of worldviews going on. And, you know, they've had to go right into the mainstream. You know, this, this, new kind of worldview that doesn't even know how to express itself very well has to go in to negotiate with a very big mainstream. Yeah. Doesn't want to let go. It doesn't want a new worldview. You know, yeah. It doesn't even want to negotiate on those terms. Right. And it, it reminds me of Gandhi saying, um, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, yes. then they fight you, then you win. Yes. That's exactly what's happening. That's so now exactly. we're at the stage of they fight you. Right. You know, which, is, which is progress. You know, right. these people have existed all along. You know, they were just completely ignored or ridiculed, right. not taken seriously. And now it's transitioning from ridiculing them, those bozos, to yes. like, oh, like they're not going away just because we call them bozos. You know, we have to fight them. So I guess you could call it a war. I mean, I look at it in, in more of a bigger picture as a phase of a transitional process, you know, where, where the – um, collective body of Europe or even of the West or humanity is, is holding on to a story that's no longer working, um, clinging to a life or a way of being that is obsolete. And, and it's scary, you know, like, you know, you see the writing on the wall, like in a candid moment, probably you take half or two thirds of those European ministers and they're going to say, yeah, this is unsustainable. And yeah. I don't really believe in it anymore. But mm -hmm. in their public persona, they can't in the structure, do that. they can't say yeah. that or, or right. even think that or act on that. But right. it's, it's hollowing out from the inside. And, right. and you know, when, when that happens, when life starts to fall apart, when you see the writing on the wall in your marriage, you know, or your yeah. job or something else, like, what do you do? You cling even tighter. Right. And you deny those yeah. data points that are telling you the game is almost up. And, yeah. and I think that that you know, Greece is one of those data points. And sometimes you can, you know, um, power through and mm -hmm. suppress the, the, that message mm -hmm. um, that it's not working. And that could happen with Greece. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, well, yeah. Well, one thing that, well. Right. One thing that's slightly afoot, now we don't really know if this is afoot, but you can feel it, is that there certainly is... A, Part of the fight is get rid of this government. Just get this government out. 
Um, and to me, part of what this referendum might result in if a yes vote comes through is actually the fall of the government. Already the finance minister has said, I will not be able to continue because ethically I just cannot go back in there and try and negotiate on these terms. There's just no way I can do that. Um, the prime minister, of course, has not said anything like that, but it really does feel to me as a Greek citizen that part of the tactics of Europe is, could you just please get this bloody government out of here? Because they don't want Podemos to follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want, you know, they don't want an upsurge of this, this kind of, uh, of government. Yes. It's so, interesting. So I have, some, I have some political advice. Here. Yeah. I have some political advice for the, for the government, which I'm sure is going to listen to this, <laughs> uh, which is that, that if, if, if there is a yes vote that they could, um, resign. The government yeah. could resign and, and not with a petulant attitude, no. but, but say, um, um, you know, the Greek people have made their choice and this isn't what I believe in. So mm -hmm. I'm going to graciously bow out and make room for leaders who resonate with the choice that the Greek people have made. And maybe someday the Greek people will change their mind. And mm -hmm. if so, I am ready and willing to serve. Right. Um, but, right. but to really, the important thing is that, that they can't go the way, they must not go the way of almost every other political party that's ever existed where their, um, their main motivation is power. Mm -hmm. Their main motivation is to win the election. Their main motivation is to stay in power. And it, within that parameter, of course, they want to do the things that they believe in. But those come second. They can't yeah. do that. They have yeah. to stay. Um, in this attitude of, of service to something right. greater than their own power. Right. And, and, you know, this was what George Orwell warned against, actually, in 1984. Um, the, the ideology of the party that ruled society was that they're doing this for an eventual positive end, and anything is justified. Yeah. Uh, power become, but then power, which originally starts out as a means, becomes an end. Right. And, and it's similar to money, actually, which mm -hmm. starts out as a means to, right. to buy things, but it becomes an end in and of itself because it is a universal means. So I think mm -hmm. that, if, that in the long run, if Syriza does bow out graciously, it will have a positive effect on you know, Podemos yeah. and you know, the five stars and, and all these other ones. Right, right. Um, and yeah. for me, you know, Charles, what I'm, what I'm really seeing is that um, whether we get a yes or a no, the reality of having to learn new habits, new norms, new ways of living together is ahead of us. And I personally say hallelujah to that because I don't like this individualistic, scarcity-based, fear-based societies that we live in, right? And that work is already in progress. It will continue in its own way in the movement that it is, you know, scattered, small scale, but people starting to create the new world in, in their own, in their own way. Um, and then there is also the powerful of having, and you know, the, the no vote for me is a show of readiness of a society, not the whole society, but sufficient number of the society to enter into that unknown because the crack is so big, right? You cannot cover it up anymore. We cannot bring it. You can try and fill it with as much debt, but it's uh -huh. too big now. Mm -hmm. It's just too big. And so the, the no vote for me is enough people saying we cannot accept these terms. We have no idea how we're going to get out of this debt, but we know we want a different way of getting out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to me, the need of our government to put as much time as it's been done this past five months in this negotiation into actually developing a modern day Marshall Plan or something that brings people back into working, you know, in, in a way that helps people to feel dignified or a real listening 
to the new solidarity economy that has happened, right? And an infrastructure that supports it. Yes, you can pay your taxes with the local alternative currency, right? Mm -hmm. And how you pay your taxes is you do community work. Yeah. Um, it's been done in other places. There is no reason why we cannot do it. Um, but in a way, when you're so entrapped in this current financial system, because all these measurements, you know, even these projections of growth or whatever, I sometimes sit there and I've done economics, I've done all of that stuff, and I think, like, they're the wrong measurements. They don't mm -hmm. measure life. <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't measure how life actually creates life yes they're in the head they're mm -hmm. disconnected from the body and the mother the earth you know they are not real and until we greeks start producing again we are blessed with a land that produces two harvests a year two three harvests a year for god's sake today i went to my local farmer's market and I was walking through it, which happens twice a week in my local neighborhood here. And it happens everywhere all over Athens. And I was thinking, why do we import potatoes? And why do we import lemons from Argentina? And what, like, there is definitely the means to feed ourselves, which is one of the basics, right? We have so much mountain water all over our, and we've got the ways in which to, if we, you know, there's just so much of the basics that are here. We're blessed with incredible culture, you know, her heritage of where we come from. And I'm not just meaning the ancient. I'm, I'm also meaning the more modern time. There is no need to be afraid yes. of anything. The only thing we should be afraid is to continue with the debt. That's where the fear is, you know. And yet, and yet, we have to also unshackle ourselves from money to the extent that we have become, you know, our identity with money and, and wealth equaling money is a, is a very, very big yeah. thing. Um, yeah. And it feels the trauma and the pain of the, of the history we've had. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Thank you, Maria. That's a really beautiful statement. Um, you know, we all, we all do see that the financial crisis is just the super a superficial level of a much deeper change that does come back to, you know, re-embracing the qualitative and the intimate and, and the mother, you know, and the right. land and the soil and, and these, these qualitative relationships that, you know, if you lack those, you're lost. If, you, <laughs> yeah. Like you need to compensate for the loss of intimate community with right. people on land, you need an infinite amount of money. Right. And, and you keep buying stuff you don't need. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's, um, maybe, maybe we should, we should, uh, uh say goodbye. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, I think I will put this online if it's okay mm -hmm. with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, and we'll put, it up, put, it up, put it up there and see, uh, how people yeah. respond to it. It's been kind mm -hmm. of an experiment, but it's been fun mm -hmm. for me. I mean, we could just go on for hours and hours. There's so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, yeah, we're, we're coming to the, the kind of closing of it. And it's, uh, I, I think whatever way we go, the referendum to me was a protection mechanism of our prime minister mm -hmm. and also a shock tactic to the Europeans that I can't decide on my own, I'm asking my people. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people are against the referendum because they say it's not been done within our constitution and it's not been done timely, you know, time-wise and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And we can get very, very detailed in our um, opinions about these things. But there's something we, it's already happened. We've defaulted. Yeah. It happened. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. You know, it's happened. So what's ahead of us is unknown, whether it's a yes or a no. And I don't believe that the movement of the solidarity that has happened is going to stop. It's going to increase regardless of, of any of that. Yeah. Um, and 
yeah, I just, I'm really holding space for these people and this land that we actually reconnect to the strength that we have and the resilience that we, that we have. Um, and to not have that fear take us over. You know? It's well, just unnecessary. Th- thank you for, uh, thank you for, you know, thank you and the Greek people for taking the step into uncertainty. Um, you're certainly not going to be the last to mm-hmm. do that. Um, no, we're, absolutely. We're uh, going to be following you <laughs> in one way or another. So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. thank you. This is a pleasure. Yes. And, um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Yes, and hope to yeah. meet you in person one day. Yeah. Okay. Likewise. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.